Hi, everybody. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, and I am so excited to welcome you to Small Biz Chat Live tonight. We have a very special show for you, and there's a reason why. This is my 10th anniversary for 10 years. Every Wednesday night, I have been giving you small business information so that you can get what you need to take your business to the next level. And tonight, our anniversary show, live here on Facebook, live on YouTube. We're also live on Twitter. Y'all know I can't forget my Twitter peeps. We are live everywhere, and I want to give you an amazing time with us tonight. Now, this show would not be possible were it not for our generous sponsor, Mixmax. And if you're using Gmail, you need Mixmax because it's a great way to add marketing automation to your emails. If you don't want to go back and forth trying to figure out a time to meet, it lets you give your availability right in the email and you can check when people open up your stuff. So it is a great tool. Check it out. Go to Mixmax.com and see what they're talking about. All right. Now, Normally, we're live on Twitter with just one guest, but you guys know when we do Small Biz Chat Live, we've got three guests. And tonight, we are going to be talking with Neil Patel. He is one of the internet's top online marketing gurus. And you guys, I got him here for you tonight. And if that's not enough, I know everybody thinks they got a book in them. Well, we're going to be talking about all things related to the book business with Stephanie Chandler, who's a multiple author and she runs the Nonfiction Authors Association. And for those of you that are doing retail, I have not forgotten about you. I've got the amazing Romina Brown here tonight and she's gonna be talking to us about how to expand your sales if you're doing retail. You know, it's a war out here in retail. So she's gonna be talking about what's going on in retail and how you can boost your brick and mortar sales in your business. Now with that, I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. We do small biz chat because our focus is to end small business failure. And with that, let me introduce my first guest, top online marketer, Neil Patel. He is the co-founder of Crazy Egg, Hello Bar, and Kismetrics. He helps companies like Amazon, NBC, GM, HP, and Viacom grow their revenue. He's a New York Times bestselling author, and the Wall Street Journal calls him the top influencer on the web. He helps Fortune 5 companies and small business owners, too. That's why we have him here. And listen to this, you guys. His stats are amazing. His marketing blog gets 3 million visitors a month. His marketing school podcast generates over 1 million listeners a month. His YouTube channel has over 10 million views. He's got almost a million followers on Facebook, and he has over 300,000 followers on Twitter, too, like me. All right, so I am so excited to welcome Neil Patel here tonight. Neil, welcome to Small Biz Chat for our 10th anniversary show. Welcome. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, I've been following you for a while, and I'm a big fan of um, your Marketing School podcast, and I'm excited in our second segment. We're going to dig into that, but you are the online marketing guru, so I want to dive right in. I want to, I want to, you know, squeeze every little morsel I can out of you. Um, now, let's say I built a beautiful website, but it's not converting for crap, right? I'm not getting traffic. <laughs> I'm not generating sales. It can really be overwhelming for a small business owner to figure out how to tackle a problem like this. So if you were recommending something for them to drive traffic, increase conversions, and their rank optimization, I mean, where do they go first? How do do we build a plan as a small business owner to start attacking this? Yeah, there's a lot of free stuff that you can use as a small business owner. So um, for example, if you already have the visitors and they're not converting, there's free tools like hotjar.com where they'll show you what people are doing that are converting and what people are not doing that aren't converting. You can then take that and make changes to your site so then that way you can get more engagement and more sales by doing more and showing more of the stuff that people want to see. Because hot jar will show you what people are doing. What is that tool again? Because I missed it. What was that tool? Hotjar, H-O-T-J-A-R. Hotjar, okay. All right, what next? I can use Hotjar and figure out what's going on. What next? Yeah, and then uh, you can use uh, tools like MailChimp to collect emails and send emails. It's another free tool. 
And that's a good way to get more sales as well, because the moment someone opts into your email list, it's much easier to convert them into a sale. So that's a second free tool that I would use if you want more conversions. And then if you want more traffic, there's a free marketing tool called Uber Suggest that helps you get more search traffic from Google rank higher. And again, all these tools are free. All right. So what if I got a little bit of budget and I want to go after this problem? Where do I spend money first? Do I spend it on SEO? Do I spend it on paid ads? Do I do retargeting? Where do I go? I typically would start with paid advertising because you can pick specifically the type of people you want, the demographics, the keywords they're going after, and where you want to end up driving those people to convert them. That's where I would start. Okay. All right. I think that's fair. So when you're putting together your plan, you call that a CRO or a conversion rate optimization plan, right? When you're trying to figure out how to get more conversions, get better conversions, all of this, when you're kind of figuring it out, that's what you call it. Correct. You got it right. All right. Now, digital marketing is changing at a rapid pace. Where do you see it going in the next two to five years? And how can we, as small business owners, you know, really be proactive and prepare for for where digital marketing is going. It's going to be connected to the offline world. Just think of it this way. You got a fridge. Everyone has a fridge in their home. You're running out of milk. Your fridge eventually is going to tell you, hey, you're running out of Altadena milk. Have you ever thought about ordering uh, silk almond milk? It tastes very similar and it's half the cost and we can send it to you in the next four hours. And these fridge companies are going to be making money off of ads because people are going to be like, yeah, promote my milk, promote my cheese, promote my bread instead of the competitors. And you're going to start seeing a lot of the places you go right now to buy ads on the internet also being the places you go in the future to probably buy ads in places like televisions, to places like your fridge, your microwave, whatever it may end up being. Got it. Got it. Okay. So everything's going to be selling to me everywhere I go. My refrigerator, my clock radio. Now, actually, I use Alexa in my home. And what I notice is every time I ask Alexa to go to a certain radio station, the people who paid for that time get their ad on before my radio station comes on. So I'm already starting to see some of this stuff you're talking about where they're already selling to you, even through the voice voice search stuff. Now, what are some online marketing tips for entrepreneurs that are just starting off? I, I'm just starting my business. I got limited resources. You know, other than the free tools you told us to figure out what's going on if your website isn't converting, what are some of the other things you think they should do? Look, you're connected with people on the social web. doesn't matter if you have 10 friends on Facebook or a thousand. Whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, put out content related to you, your business, whether it's videos, it could be audio, but just bust out your phone. We all have them. Film yourself, upload the content, and I kid you not, you'll start getting more traffic and a portion of those people will convert into sales. Is is just is just that easy, Neil? I mean, well, you you're not going to get as many sales as you want, but it's a great way to start, right? Okay. You got to start small and simple. There, you can do a hundred different things, but why not start off with the stuff that works and you can do with ease? And after you're up and running and you're making a bit more money, then you can expand to other stuff that takes longer and costs more money. Got it. Got it. All right. So, what are the, some of the mistakes that people need to avoid out here if they want to have a successful online launch? Yeah, uh, a few of the mistakes are, one, when people are launching, they always create sites based off of what they want. You know, yeah, you may end up buying your product once, but you're not going to buy it a hundred or a thousand times. So you got to get the input of other people who are your ideal customers and see what they think of your website. See what they think of your messaging, your content, your copy, and then use that information to make, you know, informed decisions. And that way it's relevant to the people who are out there. The second mistake people make is they think, oh, I got all these people coming to my site. They're just going to buy. I wish the world was that easy. But, you know, when people go into stores, think of like a mall, there's a lot of people who are just window shoppers or browsing. They'll even try on stuff, but they don't buy. And that's the reality of it. You need to make sure you're collecting email addresses. Without the email addresses, you won't do well. You need to keep getting people back to your site and email is a great way to do it. And then the third is once things are working, 
people just assume that their business is going to keep going up and they're going to keep making money and life is great, but that's not the reality of it. You're going to have competition, market conditions change. You need to always keep improving yourself, your product, your business, and never stop. Good stuff, good stuff. I co-sign on all of that. Now, I know a lot of people, you say, okay, if you got a little bit of budget, invest in paid ads. But a lot of people are losing their shirt on paid ads and, and, and they're struggling with it. You know, do you have some rules of thumb for people if they're getting started with paid advertising? Uh, one of the rule of thumbs that I have is people should have upsells and downsells. So paid ads are expensive. If someone buys your product, you're probably going to lose money on the front end. You need to make sure you have upsells and downsells. So when someone buys one product, pitch them another product that's related. Pitch them another one after that. By doing that, it makes your paid ads much more profitable. It allows you to keep up with the competition and continually spend more. All right. Good stuff. Um, now, I know you're a real big believer in the long blog posts. I've actually read blog posts that you've written about the long blog posts. All right. So now tell me, how long are we talking, Neil? Are we talking 1,500 words? Are we talking 3,000 words? When you say long blog posts, and by the way, you give me hives when you say that. So when you say long blog posts, what are you talking about? Typically, you want your blog posts to be thorough enough where you're getting the point across and someone can go and take action on whatever they read. If you can get your message across and make sure your content's amazing and better than the competition in a hundred words or 500 words, good for you. But in most cases, it's going to be 2000 plus words. I thought you were going to go there. 2000 plus words. Lord, that's a chapter in a book. Isn't it Stephanie? We're going to get to Stephanie in a minute. <laughs> All right. Now, the, is the podcast really the best way to promote a business these days? Podcast is one way. The business mar or marketing right now has moved to omni-channel approach. You used to be able to promote a business off of one channel. There was companies who were built just off of social media or email marketing or SEO or just paid ads. That doesn't exist too much anymore because all these spaces are competitive. Now you're going to have to take an omni-channel approach and leverage all the major channels. doesn't mean you got to start with all of them. It just means that you're going to end up leveraging all of them. It's just a question of when. Well, Neil, I'm going to put a pin in that right there. That was so helpful. And here on Small Biz Chat, you know, our mission is to end small business failure. And we appreciate you teaching us about some of the building blocks of online marketing. But don't go away. When we come back, we're going to get some inside tips on Neil's video podcast, The Marketing School. We'll be right back. I'm Melinda Emerson. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back. Since we implemented MixMax, our uh, open rates are 86%, our reply rates are 52%, and our RSVP yes rates, 41%. My advice for other companies interested in MixMax is definitely go for it. Uh, it's also a really easy onboarding process. It's very user-friendly, it's easy to get in there. Uh, I wish we had started using it a lot sooner, and it's, it's made my life much, much easier. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. This is our 10th anniversary show. For 10 years, we have been helping you end small business failure. We're back now with our guest, Neil Patel, online marketing guru. Now, he is also the co-founder of Crazy Ag and Kidsmetric. And now we're going to be talking about his incredibly popular podcast and YouTube channel, Marketing School. Now, my first question for you, Neil, about Marketing School is you do it every day. I mean, I thought doing a weekly chat for an hour was a lot of work. You do marketing school every day. Can you talk to us about how you made the decision that that was how you were going to differentiate your, your podcast and your, your, your video YouTube channel? 
Yeah, the world's a chaotic place. People don't have a ton of time. So I was like, oh, why not do something that's short and sweet and every single day, like five minutes? And that's my model. Now, even though it's daily, I don't really record daily. I'll record for two hours straight and produce 15 days or, you know, 18 days, maybe 20 days worth of content and podcast. So it's not too bad. Um, but yeah, I, I did that and it's worked out really well because everyone's like, wow, the world's really a hectic, chaotic place. Five minutes a day is the sweet spot when it comes to content. Wow. And you're almost at a thousand shows. I looked the other day, you guys are just, just, just almost at your thousands show, which is just like mind boggling to me. How do you keep the content fresh in marketing school? The community, they keep giving us ideas on what to talk about. And we also read a lot and just keep up to date with whatever's happening in the space. And that gives us new, fresh ideas because marketing is consistently changing. It definitely is. Now, I know you have a co-host, Eric Sue. Now, do you think it's very helpful to have a co-host? Like, do you, did you feel like you needed one, like to play off together? Or are you guys just really good friends? Is it, oh, let's start a podcast. Like, how did you make the decision about, you know, two of you versus doing it yourself? It was the second one. We were just like, oh, we're really good friends. Let's just start a podcast. That's really how it happened. <laughs> but yeah, it, it does help because, uh, you know, when I'm stuck and I don't have any ideas, he may come up with some. When he's stuck, I may have some ideas. Yeah, having a co-host isn't bad. It's helpful. You can also do it by yourself too and then interview other people. Either one works. Interesting, interesting. Now, on a recent podcast, you talked about knowing when it's time to quit something. If you're just not gaining traction and not making money, can you elaborate a little bit on it? I actually really thought that one was fascinating. Yeah, some people just keep going when they're not doing well. If you're not doing well, you can't get the numbers to go on to the right. Sometimes a business isn't meant to keep pushing forward. I'm not trying to be negative. It's just the reality. It's, it's, if that was the case, everyone as entrepreneur would succeed and there'd be no employees. But um, yeah, when things aren't working out and you just can't make them work no matter how hard you try, just sometimes it's not meant to be and it's time to quit and move on to something else. Well, I mean, I think that that's good, but that, that does feel a little bit harsh. <laughs> Tell me something. What is the best marketing advice anyone ever gave you? The best marketing advice that anyone ever has given me, and this isn't a trick question, uh, they always say, who's the best marketer? And it really comes down to who can spend the most money. So the best marketing advice I ever got is make sure your business is really fine-tuned. So do you got amazing product page, reviews, pictures, everything. Like when you fine tune it, it allows you to spend more than other people. That's who's going to win at the end of the day. Now, that's interesting. I always thought social media leveled the playing field. And you say it's back to who can spend the most on ads. Yeah, because social media used to be where if you have a ton of followers, you would do well. But now your reach is limited by their algorithms if you have a million fans or 10 million or a hundred thousand barely anyone's going to see your information sadly that is sad as much work as it took to get all those followers anywho all right neil hang around we're going to bring you back for our hit it or quit it panel at the end you have been great thank you so much for being here with us up next we're going to be talking with stephanie chandler and she is the ceo of the Nonfiction writers association and she's going to help us learn all about the book business i'm melinda emerson the small biz lady this is small biz chat live and we'll be right back My new book, Fix Your Business, is really about encouraging people to take back control of their business and change how their businesses is run. It's not okay to skip paychecks. It's not okay to never feel like you can take a vacation. And it's also not okay to not know how much profit you've made in your business until your taxes are done. I really want business owners to stop letting their businesses be runaway trains. I've written this book to teach people processes and systems to help them run their businesses intentionally. My goal is to help existing entrepreneurs create a business that allows them to live their dream life.
Hi, everyone. I'm Melinda Emerson, and welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. Now we're going to be talking with Stephanie Chandler. Now, I have to tell you, I have been a fan of Stephanie Chandler's for a long time time. Back in 2000, I think 2008 it was, Stephanie wrote this book called From Entrepreneur to Infopreneur that actually changed my life and made me become the small biz lady. And I have been a fan of hers and we have become very good friends over the years. She is the CEO of the Nonfiction Writers Association, but she is an author in her own right. One of my favorite books she has written, it's called Own Your Niche. And Stephanie Chandler, welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. Hey, Melinda, I am honored to be here. Happy 10th anniversary. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Now, you have become like the book lady, right? So tell me about how many books have you published and and how can a book help you promote your business? Well, I myself have authored 10 books to date. I've published books for dozens of other authors Um, But how can it help you grow your business? A book adds instant credibility. The word authority begins with author, right? So it will impress prospective clients. It will help you get books for speaking engagements. There is no other business card like writing a book. All right. So you can use a book to generate leads then, right? Oh, for sure. You can mail books to prospects that are hard to reach I, I've worked with a guy who's a financial advisor. All he does is hand out books to prospective clients. And think about that. If you're going to go and interview financial advisors and you interview, they both have pretty much the same pitch, but one hands you a copy of his book. Which one do you think you're going to hire? It's amazing the impact it makes. I think that's a great idea for all you guys out here. I hope you guys are listening and writing some of these gems down because my guests are dropping knowledge on here tonight. Now, <laughs> For business owners who want to land a speaking gig, a book, how can a book help somebody land a speaking gig? Well, you and I are both members of the National Speakers Association, and every professional speaker will tell you, you have to have a book. It gets back to that credibility. Put it in your bio. It shifts the whole perspective of people who are going to hire you to speak. Absolutely. I know for me, um, not only the first thing when I joined NSA in 2007, the first thing they said was not only do you have to write a book, but you have to write a good book. (laughs) That's right. It can't just be any book. It was what I was told. So I was like, well, with my journalism degree, I think I'm safe. I think I can do it. Um, And praise God, I think I did. So, um, you know, If you, I want to ask you sort of like a marketing question about books. So I know a lot of times when people write books, they set up a book website and they do all this stuff like for their book. If they have an existing business, does it make sense for them to put that book on that existing website? Or do you think it's, does it make sense for somebody to get the URL, you know, and and do another book website? I am not a big fan of a book website. I mean, if you plan to to do what I've done and write 10, 20, 30 books in your career, you're going to be managing a lot of websites. And I say brand you. Brand you as the author. Drive all of your traffic back to one place. That is your better long game. All right. You heard it here first. The book guru said it. All right. Now, when should you start promoting a book? Like, as I know a lot of people say, 12 to 18 months before the book's coming out, start blogging about, you know, but is that true? When should you start promoting a book when it's going to write to come out? Well, definitely not after it's come out. You want to do it before (laughs) it comes out. Uh, So, you know, as many months in advance as possible, but get your audience engaged. Have them vote on your book title. Have them vote on your book cover. Our social media audiences love to be involved in those decisions and feel like they're a part of your, your launch you know, bring in beta readers. Those are people you give early access to your manuscript. That's a way, great way to get people on the ground running, talking about your book when it comes out. So as far in advance as possible is my best advice. Now, when it comes to promoting a book, are you saying, is it is it blogging? Is it podcasting? Is it videos? What's the deal? What, what is your best option when you're, when you're thinking, if, you, if you've got limited time and limited resources, what is the best thing to do? You got to go where your tribe is. So where are they spending time? Where are you most engaged? I mean, obviously for you, Melinda, it's Twitter and Facebook, 
right? For somebody else, it might be LinkedIn. I just worked with an author who's got a huge presence on LinkedIn. And so the bulk of his promotion efforts go there. So the, the key is find your tribe and know where they're spending their time. All right. So how important is it to niche your book topic? I mean, the, the thing that I see right here now is that everybody and their mama's got a book. So how how is it that you can stand out with a book now? Because like, is it, are there any new ideas under the sun, really? I mean, like, you know. Yeah. No new ideas, but new ways to stand out, right? And it's the same for your business. You know, the more you can niche down your topic, the better your chance of standing out. Do you want to write another financial planning guide or do you want to be the financial planner for divorced women or baby boomers or people planning for their kids' college education? You know, I am always been a fan of owning a niche. I wrote a whole book on the topic. So uh, in your book is no exception to that rule. It should absolutely speak to a really targeted audience if you want to stand out in a very crowded marketplace where you have millions of books competing with you. Absolutely. You know, they've made it so easy now to publish a book. Any fool thinks they can do it. All right. Now, tell me, what is the best book marketing advice you've ever received? Well, my best business advice in general is delegate. Um, You know, we learned that through the E-Myth, right? With Michael Gerber's book, don't try to be the cook, the dishwasher, the janitor, the everybody. And my motto has always been the more I hire, the more I earn. And it's the truth. So, you know, go out and hire help. Every author, every business owner needs a virtual assistant. This is hire number one. Even if it's just five hours a month to hand off the tasks you don't want to handle, this will be one of the best investments you make in your business and your book marketing. I can't agree with you more. I'm going to co-sign on that completely. Now, Steph, I want to put a pin in this because I know the next thing we're going to get into is self-publishing versus traditional publishing because there's a whole big world out here in publishing. So stay with us, everybody. I'm Melinda Emerson, the small biz lady. Stephanie Chandler is going to be with us when we come right back. Don't go away. Are you tired of struggling in your business, not taking a paycheck, dreading dealing with your business in the morning? Are you regretting even starting your business in the first place? Well, I know you're tired, and I also remember what that kind of tired is like. But the good news is, it's time to stop feeling that way. I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady, and my new book, Fix Your Business, is a 90-day turnaround plan to get back your life and reduce chaos in your business. I've been in business nearly 20 years, and let me teach you how to build a business that works for you. Grab a copy today. We see something like an 85% open rate of our outbound email sequences You see something like a 40% reply rate to those cold sequences and outbound accounts for something like 30% of our signups right now. So we can directly attribute that to Mixmax. Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, and we are back on Small Biz Chat Live. This is our 10th anniversary show. I'm back with my guest, Stephanie Chandler, and now we're going to be talking about the pros and cons of self-publishing versus getting an agent and trying to get a traditional publishing deal. All right, Stephanie, you've done all of it, so let's let's jump into it. I have. How do you, how do you make the decision to self-publish or not? Well, I guess it partly depends on how much of a control freak you are. Uh, I'm very type A. And what drove me out of traditional publishing was giving up all that control and doing all the work and letting them reap all the rewards. I mean, a traditional publisher can change your book title. They can change copy. They can give you a book cover you don't like. I had all of these things happen to me. The final straw for me was when the publisher called and said, we want you to remove a chapter from your book. We don't care which one, we're trying to cut costs. And I swear I would never let that happen again. Uh, So, you know, there's pros and cons on both sides, no question. But if you're a control freak, you probably want to go for self-publishing. 
Um, I, I've done both. It, it's an interesting ride. I mean, I think you got to figure out what business you want to be in because, you know, you, you really do have to understand. But the other thing you have to understand is the only thing the publisher is going to do for you is sell you paper and ink. <laughs> you are going to sell every copy of that book, whether you self-publish it or whether you traditionally publish it. Know that. Um, so let's say I've decided to self-publish. So what do I need to be prepared to invest if I'm going to self-publish? Because that's not a cheap thing to do. It's not if you do it the right way, right? There's a lot of people trying to cut all the corners and saying you can get your book done for $500. Please don't do your book that way. That's what gives self-publishing a bad name. You know, a minimum investment really should be at least 10 grand. The bulk of your expense is going to be in editing. We all need editing. My last book went through four complete rounds of editing. So please make that investment a minimum of 10 grand, but probably more if you really want to do your book the right way. All right. So what are some of the advantages or disadvantages of pursuing an agent and and a publisher? Can you talk a little bit about like the timeline for that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you're seeking traditional publishing, the biggest benefit most authors focus on is that bookstore placement. Although, you you know, you've got to remember most books aren't being purchased in brick and mortar stores anymore. So that doesn't have the cachet that it once had. But there is a timeline involved, right? Because first you start by going after agents. Agents have the direct connection to the publishers. The big five won't take pitches directly from authors. You have to go through an agent. So you've got the process of querying agents, and then you've got to write a 40-page book proposal and and get them to sign off on that. And then the agent begins their pitch process. So it's very time-consuming. And then once you do, if you get offered a book deal, expect it to take another year for the publisher to get the book out. It's a very long lead time. There's really no reason why it takes them that long, except that's how they've always done it. And that's how they continue to do it. Um, But one other point about traditional publishing is on average, authors make about a dollar per book. It's pitiful. And if you self-publish, you're going to make five to $10 per book, depending on your sales outlet. So just something else to really think about. You may spend more money up front, but on the back end, you potentially will earn more revenue. All right. So let's talk about investing in publicists. Now, I know for me, every time we've launched a book, I've always engaged a publicist at least six months, three months before and then three months after um, in, in, in the book promotion process. But what is your advice and, and rule of thumb for that? My feeling is not every book is publicity publicity worthy. So not every author should make that investment. The other thing about investing in PR is it's really hard to earn back that investment on book sales, right? Because we're earning it back five or $10 at a time. So you really have to be sure that, that media coverage is going to benefit you. It probably will not result in earning it back in book sales. If you're looking to build your credibility, your media resume, um, you know, that kind of thing, publicity makes a ton of sense. If you're all about book sales and building that audience, you might be better off to spend your money on marketing with a good marketing assistant or a smaller marketing agency where your money goes a little further because publicity is expensive. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, Stephanie, what is the best book advice you can give somebody? Oh my gosh, please just do it well. Don't go to Fiverr and hire a book cover person. Don't you know skimp on the editing and let your sister, who's the English teacher, do your editing because she's not following the Chicago manualist style. I mean, there's a lot of, of details. Your book cover should be designed by somebody who designs book covers for a living. Uh, so please, you know, do it the right way. Hire experts, work with people who understand publishing because this is going to represent you in your business and you want it to be the best representation of you you can have. I will co-sign that. All right, Stephanie, stay with us. We're going to bring you back for our panel. Next, we're going to be talking with Romina Brown. She is a retail marketing expert. Those of you guys with retail stores, she's going to give you some tips on how to get more sales in the door. I'm Melinda Emerson. You're watching Small Biz Chat Live, and we'll be right back. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Melinda Emerson, Small Biz Lady. I know you might be thinking about quitting your business and going back into corporate America, but wait, before you give up, my new book, Fix Your Business, could give you a whole new lease on life. My 12 P's of running a successful business will walk you through step by step how to grow your business revenue, how to hire great people and streamline your processes and so much more. Grab a copy today of Fix Your Business and get your life back. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Small Biz Chat Live. I'm Melinda Emerson, the Small Biz Lady, America's number one small business expert. And I'm so excited to have you here for our 10th anniversary show. For 10 years, we've been helping you grow your business because our mission is to end small business failure. Now, my third guest for tonight is an amazing marketing expert. Her name is Romina Brown. She is out of Chicago. Her company, Strategic Solutions International, is an amazing company that focuses on helping brands grow their sales within a retail environment. She specifically works great with beauty brands. And I am so excited to have her here tonight just to talk about all of the things going on in retail. Retail is the wild, wild west right now. So we want to talk to Romina. Welcome to Small Biz Chat Live. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Melinda. Happy to so, be here the 10th anniversary. Thank you. Thank you. So now tell me, what are some of the major challenges facing retail? Well, as you can imagine, just in your daily life, the consumer landscape has completely shifted. Our retail options have grown so widely. I mean, you've you've seen the emergence of Instacart and home grocery delivery. You've seen more Aldi types of grocery stores um, now available in, in 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 more vicinity and closer related for consumers as it relates to convenience and being able to get more for less. And so retailers now having to reimagine their shopper uh, return on investment, how, how to improve their shopper experiences so that they can continue to drive loyalty and traffic into those retail stores. And, and then also people, as you know, are buying more online as well. Yeah, because there's a dirty word I was about to say, Amazon, right? <laughs> I would I would buy everything. From Amazon. I, I tell you, I'm a person that hates to shop. So if I if I could really, I mean, I have some specialty stores online that I shop at, but but Amazon is my go to. It, it it just really really is. Yeah, so. and I think you're not alone. Uh, <laughs> and you know they they are now uh, Whole Foods as well. So they are not only in the packaging delivery that to be the number one retailer in the world and hold virtually no inventory. <laughs> I think that's I think that really speaks to what consumers are 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 seeking. Yeah, so let's talk about um how all of this is impacting consumer packaged good folks. Like cuz that that that's that's where some of our folks are. You created a product, you 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 know, you you work really hard to get it on the short sales at Walgreens or Rite Aid or what, you know, how how can you impact that environment when it's not your store? Well, the, the point of the matter is that retailers, they're looking for solutions. They want to continue to drive growth. They want to continue to drive traffic in their stores. And so, so to speak, leadership is for the taking as it relates to retailer and manufacturer partnerships. They're looking for category growth partners, category leaders to come in and help them understand what really are the nuances that will drive sales and drive real growth. And that's based on being able to fulfill consumer needs. So it's it's about partnering with partnering with retailers. It's about innovating for unmet consumer needs in any any particular category. That's you know that spans whether it's beauty or 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 beverage or vitamins and supplements. It's really just solving consumer needs. Everything starts with the consumer and leadership is for the taking. They really are looking for manufacturer partners to provide objective deep contextual information that will help them to drive overall retail. Now, can you talk about um, how, how small products, you know, small product businesses can gain what we call, you know, the deep contextual insights from customers that they could use to innovate with a retailer, part, retail partner? 
Well, it, t- today, I think it's much easier to have uh, a deeper understanding of consumer needs because there are more touch points, quite frankly. Women and men are more in control of the messages that they receive. And those message providers are, are finding ways to capture that information so that manufacturers are not able to get, gain access to the insight from that so that they can deliver customized solutions or what we're calling, what I'm calling now, DNA thumbprinted solutions based on the history and the data that goes with that consumer or that consumer profile. It's, now, how, how okay, has it, what, but how has influencer marketing got in the mix of all this stuff? Because it seems like if, you know, Kim K or one of these people pick up a tube of lipstick, all of a sudden it's like, Everybody's got to have, you know, so, so how has influencer marketing and, you know, kind of celebrity driven marketing? You know, it's so interesting. And particularly you might imagine that is true in beauty and it, it is true irrespective of the channel, whether it's online or whether it is in a specialty store like Ulta or Sephora or in mass channels or drug or beauty supply stores, those influencers really do impact and drive the trends But what I'll say is that it promotes awareness and it generates opportunities for trial. But the key to winning and having sustained success at retail is when people make repeat purchases. Right. When anybody buys something once, right? The goal is... Exactly. Especially when it relates to beauty or hair products. If you have something that doesn't work or it weighs your hair down or it's the wrong color, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many influential people are using it. It's just not for you. And so uh, influencer marketing certainly has had its place and it's very prominent in the category. Again, I'll say it really is for awareness and trial, but not necessarily repeat. But what I will also say is that in the beauty category, many of the influencers are actually the brand creators. now, And so they've made their own connections with consumers. Some of the largest and fastest growing brands are those brands that have their own following, their own community of followers and consumers and people, consumers who they have direct contact with and they're able to control their messages to them and able to drive, you know, that direct connection at community events, at charitable organizations, connecting mom to mom or wife to wife. And it really just is making those authentic connections. And those are the brands that are really honestly seeing the most growth right now. Interesting. Now, one of the things that I feel like social media has done to fashion brands in particular is this concept of see now, buy now. You know, it seems like like these big runway shows that these brands want to have and then they want to release the product six months later. That that's not flying anymore. It seems like people want to be able to, you know, this this, this now buy now. Yes, we have. It's like people are not waiting six months to have that dress. Absolutely. That, that, that's true. And it's, it's true, I think, irrespective of, of the industry that we're talking about, whether it is fashion or, or beauty or lipstick or items for the car, for automobiles. If you see it and want it, you, you are able to hit the buy now button. And I know manufacturers and retailers are, are crazy about this because it's, most of that is ad free, <laughs> ad free, no advertising on these sites. So they are, um, or limited, I should say. And but I, I just think that it allows you to have a more direct connection with consumers, and it really is working. Particularly, as I said, in beauty, you do have the buy now. There are cosmetics brands that have been launched on these platforms. I mean, I saw a, a, a young lady who has a cosmetics brand. It's very urban, very directly connected consumers. She went on went on for thirty minutes and sold one point four million dollars in makeup. Wow, that sounds like a Neil Patel launch to me. <laughs> anyway, now, but let's but let's talk about this whole concept of Instagram and how Instagram has really. I mean, if you got a hot product or you got a product that looks good or you create a wonderful sizzle reel, you can make zillions on Instagram. It seems like Instagram was made for product businesses. I believe it. And I'm a witness. I have a front row seat to it. And I see that many of these brands that are doing so well and have a large social following that that it is translating into retail because they're able to control their messages. 
They're sending out the messages. Oh, guess what? We've been working all night and we were finally able to fill the order to retailer XYZ. Please go in and support us. You know, it's because of those direct and authentic connections and what consumers are seeing as seeing as artisan or more handcrafted products, which they're really seeking. Now, talk about um, category management. Can you explain uh, what category management is and how you can use it to drive retail sales? That's a good question because every time someone asks us, what do we do? What area are we in? And we say category management. Okay, so what is that again? Well, what it is we really are now referring to it as category growth management because we consider ourselves as stewards of growth, working with manufacturers objectively and retailers to objectively drive growth for the good of the category. And so category growth management really illuminates insights that will help our manufacturer partners to innovate in the white spaces where there are opportunities or where consumers are underserved. And we often will analyze those, what we call unsexy areas or the, the metrics related to sales, sales per unit per store, how much your, your product was sold on a promotion, what is your average velocity, what, how, how are you doing versus those brands that are in your tightest competitive set, also in your price band. So we really dig in and pull out the insights. It's more than just having the data. The data really does not do you as much good. I would say no good. It, it's, it, it really is only valuable unless you're able to extract the insight that will help you to drive your sales in a way that push you away from the competition. All right. All right. Now tell me, what is what is the re future of retail? What is the future of retail marketing? What is going to happen? Well, I, we, retailers are having to reimagine their ROI for consumers. They're, they must reimagine and maximize the return on investment. And we think that there are probably three areas that they will focus on. The first being more personalized offering. They have so much data. You know, you can't buy a piece of gum without them asking for your email address, your home phone number, you know, what grade is your child in? So how long have you been married? So you have to, they have that data and it's really to serve you better. So one, we think that. Two, we think also that they are trying to remove the pain points. They want it to be frictionless shopping for you because they know there's so much competition as well as they have to maximize their return. There's no more trading down or having to trade up. Aldi is an example. They're best in class where you can get more for less. And so we see that as the future of retailing those three areas. All right. And tell me what's the best business advice you've ever gotten? Oh, I've had so much. I, 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 I'm not one of the ones who has to learn by hitting my own head. I will watch and, and good adv get advice. Um, I think the best advice I got, though, was to... Find your niche and to drive into it, to drive the innovation in that. Do more than what anyone would ever expect in that area. Uh, get partners, collaborate. Don't be afraid to to be a pioneer just because something hasn't been hasn't been done. And people always try to tell you what can't be done until they see you doing it. So we uh, we really take uh, take that seriously and we innovate in this area to help really drive insights that will drive sustainable growth. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Romina Brown, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us from Strategic Solutions International in Chicago, Illinois. And listen, we are going to bring all of our guests back in just a second because it is time for Hit It or Quit It. All right. Now, here is how, here is how Hit It or Quit It works. We're going to bring all three of our guests back I'm gonna ask each of them the same question, but they only have 30 seconds to answer and they can't repeat an answer of another guest. And if they go over 30 minutes, 30 seconds, I'm gonna give them the cowbell. All right, so what we're gonna do. All right, so I'm gonna bring back right now, Neil Patel, Stephanie Chandler, and Ms. Romina Brown, who we just spoke with, and I'm gonna get the ball rolling. All right, did you guys hear my rules? Do you know how this works? Got it. All 30 right. seconds. All right. So, Neil, I'm going to start with you, sir. I want to know what is your favorite business app? What is your favorite? My favorite business app is Google Analytics. 
it shows you how many visitors are on your site in real time and how many sales you're generating. All right. All right. Stephanie Chandler, what's your favorite business app? Evernote. I save everything. <laughs> Evernote. It's on my phone. It's on my, my laptop. It's on everything. I like Evernote too. Romina, what's your favorite app? I was going to say Google Analytics, but also, but I will say CamScan. I scan everything. It saves me so much time. I don't keep anything. I don't write down anything. I scan everything and transfer it into my computer and then file it. Love it, love it, love it. All right, Stephanie, what is your favorite old school marketing tactic? Oh, oh that's got to be reaching out to people one by one. I don't think we do that enough. And I think if you really want to make a great connection that you either send a great email, write a letter or pick up the phone. And it's amazing the business contacts I've made by doing that. All right. All right. Romina Brown, what's your favorite old school marketing tactic? Experiential marketing, grassroots marketing, I think they used to call it, but creating those experiences so that consumers can have a real connection with the brand and to experience the essence of the brand and how it was, in, how it was intended to. I'll say experiential marketing. All right, Neil, what about you? What's your favorite old school marketing tactic? Direct mail. I know most of you guys throw away that junk mail that comes, but if you're sending it to the right people and you're also remarketing to those people online, right? You have their email addresses, you're showing up ads on Facebook, Google, and you include direct mail, you'll find that your conversions are through the roof. It's very effective and direct mail is not that expensive overall. All right, and I'm going to share mine too. So my favorite old school marketing tactic is write a handwritten note on personal stationery. That is my favorite one. People don't throw those away. All right, now I'm going to I'm going to come back to you Stephanie for this. What is your favorite podcast? Oh, I I got to say I love Pat Flynn. I think he's a ton of fun. All right, I like Pat Flynn's too. Romina, what's your favorite podcast? Uh, Deepak Chopra. All right. All right. Neil Patel, what could possibly be your favorite podcast? I love listening to Entrepreneurs on Fire by John oh, Lee Dumas. Okay. John Lee Dumas. I like that one too. Although I heard he's now charging people five grand to come on his podcast. <laughs> no, no, no. Podcast, uh, I don't know about that, but the podcast, the quality is good. So, oh, yeah. no, his quality is awesome. I just was shocked when I learned that. But you know what? One of my favorite podcasts is. It is Marketing School by Neil Patel <laughs> and Eric Sue. <laughs> uh -huh. I love, I actually really do watch it. I like it. All right. So I'm going to go back to you, Romina. How do you stay motivated? Give me your favorite motivation tip. Perseverance. I, I stay motivated with daily affirmations and trying not to be overwhelmed so much and try, just really trying to have a balanced life. Having a 10 year old homework keeps you completely <laughs> balance you can't get too out of balance but this is the real world so i think having a balanced life working out and and daily affirmations all right neil how do you stay motivated i stay motivated by just a daily checklist if you're doing tasks that you love you know that you have to go your business or get some work done but as long as you include tasks that you love on a daily basis and you do them you know you'll end the night being happy and you'll want to wake up the next day and keep working. All right. Stephanie Chandler, how do you stay motivated? Making time for the things that light me up. I, I hate doing the technical um, or I should say the tedious tasks. So I hand all of that off. And as long as I can carve out that creative time and I can be creating, uh, that keeps me super motivated to keep going. All right. Now, this is our last question. So, Neil, I'm going to start with you, sir. What is the best business book you ever read? Uh, I love Art of the Start. It's by Guy Kawasaki. For all of you small business entrepreneurs out there looking to start, gives you a good viewpoint about starting businesses. Yeah. And he just updated that book last year. So he put out Art of the Start 2.0. I'm, I'm a fan of that book as well. Uh, Romina Brown, what's your favorite business book? Fix your business, of course. <laughs> You're very sweet. Thank you very much. And Stephanie Chandler, what is your favorite business book? Hands down, Tribes by Seth Godin, my absolute favorite book. It's a game changer. 
just changes the way you think about your community. It's great. And my favorite business book is The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. I have to say it because it was like one of those books that just was such a huge aha moment for me. God, I don't remember how long ago I read it. I know he wrote it, what, about 15, 20 years ago, but it's a book that still rings true. You can pick it up right now and read it. Um, Well, listen, thank all of you guys so much for being here. I didn't have to use my cowbell. of you. So I appreciate that. So listen, this has been an amazing 10 year ride. I am so grateful to have the opportunity to be the small biz lady and to have given you guys small business advice for the last 10 years. Special thanks to tonight's guests, Neil Patel, Stephanie Chandler, Romina Brown, you guys are friends and, and I appreciate your kindness for coming on and helping me celebrate tonight. You know, We will be back on Twitter next week, April 24th. Our guest is Adrienne Turner, Coach Adrienne. And she's going to be talking to us about how to accomplish your goals in your small business. So don't miss it. But, you know, for the past 10 years, it has been my pleasure to execute our mission to end small business failure. I am Melinda Emerson. I am the small biz lady. And until next time, remember this, you never lose in business. Either you win or you learn. God bless everybody. Good night.